Great. Well, welcome. Thanks for uh, thanks for coming out. So Kyle Robertson is going to um, defend his honor thesis um, this afternoon. So Kyle's been working with me for over two years. Although this thesis, well, the, the, the formal part of the thesis, I guess, is related to the work in the last year. Um, so uh, officially, Professor Adam Wally is the is the chair, um, and uh, so we'll have a presentation, which should be about 25 minutes, 20 minutes. Um, then we'll take questions from the audience, and then we'll ask the, the non-committee members to leave. We'll talk to Kyle after that. Um, so, anyway, I'm excited to hear Kyle's defense. And Thanks, Andrew. Uh, would you mind hitting the lights? Thanks, guys. All right. So, for those of you that don't know me, uh, my name is Kyle Robinson, and today I'm going to talk to you guys about uh, path integral Monte Carlo absorption studies of superfluid helium-4 in mesophore silicates. So before I begin, I just want to acknowledge a few people and organizations that made this project possible. Uh, the Vermont Advanced Computing Corps is just a compute cluster that uh, researchers at the university are allowed to use, and um, the Open Science Grid cluster of the Extreme Science and Engineering and Discovery Environment. Um, both these uh, organizations provided the computational resources that made this project possible, uh, so I thought they deserved to be acknowledged. I also want to talk, uh, acknowledge a few special people that, that made this all happen. Uh, Adrian, my advisor, I'd like to thank you uh, for all your guidance and support. Uh, Larry Kotov and Adam Wally, my committee members, for taking time out of their busy schedules to be here today. Uh, Max Graves, a former graduate student of Adrian's, really helped me kind of get acquainted with Adrian's research and was uh, really helpful. Matt Ringe, an employee at Exceed, uh, helped me get my simulations up and running, which was uh, really useful. Uh, all the members of the Dell Maestro group, you know, our conversations have been uh, inspiring and informative, so I'd like to thank you guys for, you know, all your help. And finally, the remainder of my colleagues and professors at the physics department, uh, this has been a really great place to learn and grow, and um, I just wanted to say thank you guys for uh, working with me. So, let's begin. I first want to talk to you guys a little bit about superfluid helium-4, what it is. So first, helium-4 is a boson, which is a really, really important property when examining its phase diagram shown here. So first, you'll notice a lack of a triple point where the gas, liquid, and solid phases would normally meet. And what instead you see is this transition from a normal fluid to something called a superfluid at around um, 2.17 degrees Kelvin. And helium remains a superfluid all the way down to zero temperature below 25 bars of pressure. And this superfluid phase is a manifestation of something called Bose-Einstein condensation. So because helium-4 is a boson, as you reduce the temperature, a macroscopic number of particles can condense into a single particle state. And in the case of low temperatures, all these particles are, con are condensing into the ground state or the zero momentum state. And this condensation causes all sorts of interesting properties to arise in the fluid. Um, here's just a list of the most important ones. First is uh, zero viscosity, a complete lack of viscosity. Um, second is dissipationless mass transport. This means the fluid can flow without losing energy to any excitations. And finally, long-range correlations exist in the fluid. Um, this means that the one-body density matrix has finite off-diagonal matrix elements at large separations, therefore correlating spatially separated regions of the fluid. In my study, um, I'm examining mostly this zero viscosity aspect of the, uh, of the fluid. So because of this, um, helium can flow through very, very tiny nanopores, um, such as those found in mesopore silicates, and this is often referred to as a superlink. So, um, now that we've established these properties, I want to talk a little bit about mesopore silicates, you know, what they are. Um, so here's just kind of an image to give you a visual picture of what they are. It's basically a honeycomb of silicon. You see straight hexagonal pores. Um, these are reg regular hexagons. Um, and the pore size is completely tunable experimentally, which is a really desirable property because it allows you to examine um, how the size of the pore affects the behavior of the helium inside of it. And finally, this system, specifically helium-4 and mesopore silicates, has been studied extensively experimentally. Here's just a list of a few references I've encountered in my research, um, most of them um, involving a researcher called Junko Taniguchi, which Adrian and I have had uh, correspondence with during my project. So you guys are probably wondering, you know, why should anyone care about helium-4 and mesopore silicates? What's the scientific importance? And um, the reason this is important is because superfluid helium absorbed into mesopore silicates is a physical realization of a one-dimensional quantum fluid. And in one dimension, very, very interesting things start to happen. So first you see um, enhanced fluctuations in the system. When I, when I say fluctuations, I mean both thermal and quantum fluctuations. And this disrupts the long-range order we talked about in the bulk case. Um, 
Second, there's a lack of definite particle statistics in 1D. This means fermions and bosons start to look the same in one dimension. And this is a manifestation of a lack of grading statistics um, in 1D. Essentially, particle exchange um, has the same effect on the wave function for both bosons and fermions. Um, additionally, there are strong interactions and collective excitations. In 1D, um, when you excite one particle because of the dimensional restriction, all the surrounding particles are necessarily excited as well. And in 1D, you, you get to observe these, these kind of interesting quasi-liquid solid phases. It's liquid in the sense that there's um, a lack of long-range order, but it's solid in that there's um, well-localized particle positions because of the dimensional confinement. And all of these interesting behaviors can be described universally by something called Ludinger liquid theory, which is very connected to my research. So I just want to talk a little bit about that. Um, it's kind of formulated uh, using this, these boson, bosonic field operators. Rho of x is the particle density of position x. These field operators um, create and annihilate a boson at position x. Here's the form of the field operator. Phi is a phase. And theta of x is a parameter um, whose derivative is actually the density. And so this is the Hamiltonian on uh, the Leidenger liquid theory. K and V are phenomenological parameters, often referred to as the Leidenger liquid parameters, that can be connected to physically observable quantities, such as the superfluid fraction here, which is just V over K, and the compressibility, which is V times K. And these quantities are accessible um, to the path integral simulations I ran. I'll talk about this, that in a second. Um, and so K, here's kind of the regimes you see um, as related to K. When K is zero, you're looking at a superfluid. When it's infinity, you're looking at a solid. And in this middle ground, you're looking at a sort of quasi-solid liquid phase. And so, in my simulations, to get at these parameters, what I've done is a large-scale numerical simulation of a completely microscopic Hamiltonian. So this Hamiltonian takes into account every particle in the system. Here you see the familiar uh, kinetic energy operator. Here's just a pairwise interaction between particles in the case of my simulations, um, it's the interaction between helium atoms, which is well described by the disease potential. And here you have some external confining potential. And a big part of my project was understanding the form of this potential inside uh, pore mesopore silicates. So now that you have this Hamiltonian, you, what you want to do is sample the many particle configurations, the configurations of your system, that are most likely to contribute to the statistical partition function, which is given here as the trace of the quantum, mechan quantum mechanical density operator in the energy basis. And here it's just um, noted that you can break the Hamiltonian into a sum of kinetic energy and potential energy components. And once you've uh, sufficiently sampled this statistical partition function, you can calculate pretty much any observable quantity of interest as just an average or a trace of the product between that, ob that observable's quantum mechanical operator and the uh, density of interest there. So how does path integral Monte Carlo sample these configurations in an efficient way? Um, it can broadly be summarized as an exploitation of the quantum classical isomorphism. And what that tells you is that any quantum system in D dimensions can be mapped to a classical system in D plus one dimensions. In the case of path integral Monte Carlo, this additional dimension is imaginary time, which is shown here on the vertical axis. So here you have some beads which correspond to the spatial positions of a single particle. You have some many particle configuration, and this is a simple example, there's only four particles. And then you allow this configuration to propagate through imaginary time, constructing something that's referred to as a world line. And now this construction is periodic in imaginary time. So this first bead and this last bead actually coincide, which allows you to view a quantum mechanical system of particles as a classical system of ring polymers, which is shown here. So now that I've kind of given you guys a vague sense of how path integral Monte Carlo works, I want to talk about um, how I constructed the external potential operator that I talked about in the previous slide. Um, so what I did was model the surrounding silicate as a uniformly polarizable and continuous glass interacting with helium via the Leonard-Jones potential, which is shown here. So just talking about the structure of this potential, you have an attractive van der Waals term here and a semi-empirical repulsive term which is added to account for the hardcore or poly repulsion of these particles. Sigma is a length scale that is a measure of the size of the hardcore, and epsilon is an energy scale. Um, to give you an idea of what these quantities actually mean, I have this little plot right here. So energy basically sets the depth of the potential minima of the interaction between particles, and sigma 
gives you a measure of how far the particles are from each other before the interaction becomes repulsive. So in my simulation, um, sigma and epsilon are the interaction width parameters between helium and oxygen. This silicate is an aggregate of silicon and oxygen particles, but silicon is a relatively inert element, so you can ignore those interactions, the parameters are zero, and instead um, consider the interaction parameters just between helium and oxygen, which are shown here. So, um, moving more to the technical side of this model, how did I actually do the calculation? And I utilized the principle of superposition, which tells you that the response of any linear system to some complex stimuli uh, can be constructed as a sum of simpler stimuli. So what I did first was, was calculated the confinement potential of, here white space is just empty space, gray is polarizable material, so I modeled the energy environment inside this empty hexagonal pore, surrounded infinitely on all sides uh, by polarizable material, noting that the z-axis actually ex extends out of the uh, projection here and is also infinite. And then once I finished that calculation, what I did was actually subtracted out prisms of polarizable material where these cavities should be located, surrounding the central core of interest. And what that gives you is a picture that looks like this, which is a, which is a more accurate model of what a mesoporous silicate looks like to a helion inside of it. So, starting with calculation one, this just gives you uh, an idea of the structure of the calculation. So, um, if you're in, you, what you're interested in is the potential energy at a point P, labeled by x coordinate f and y coordinate g. Here, s of theta is the distance from that point to the edge of the hexagon. And s of theta actually has six different expressions depending on what edge you're looking at. Because helium, or I mean, because a hexagon is a, a necessarily piecewise structure, um, you have six different expressions for x, s of theta. So the total potential for this first calculation is actually a sum of six different parts, and these parts are shown here. This integral can actually be calculated um, analytically, but the expressions are somewhat unwieldy, so I left them out of this slide for simplicity. Note that these angles here are bounds on the angles, which again are different depending on what section you're looking at. The, um, the angles are labeled by these points A, B, C, B, etc., and have dependence on your observation point F and G and the side length of the hexagon T. Moving to the second calculation, what you need to do is find the potential energy um, experienced at some point by a, a hexagonal prism of infinite axial extent centered on some point A and B, again, the side length T. And this can just be summarized by these two integrals here, which I've done uh, numerically. Um, the reason there are two is because you have to split the hexagon in half. Um, so once you have this calculation in hand, which is um, for an arbitrary point A and B, what you can do is fix these prisms in their correct positions in the lattice using two lattice vectors which are shown here, U and V. Um, T is the side length of the hexagon, epsilon is the thickness of the walls, and T is a parameter that's used in um, the definition of these lattice vectors, and little t and big t are related here. So now what you do is basically just sum over lattice vectors. You're summing over integers M and M, which um, define this linear combination of the lattice vectors U and V, and um, yeah, just sum over these lattice vectors and um, get contributions from all the uh, hexagonal prisms which are centered on these points. So now the total potential, the uh, third image I showed in a few previous slides, um, is the first calculation, an isolated pore, and then you subtract out an array of prisms to get a silicate-like model. Here, these are dimensional constants. V1 and V2 are dimension less, and um, by dimensional analysis, to get the correct units of energy, you have to have these dimensions here. So here's a plot of um, the potential along a line from the center to a corner. So if you go back one slide, it's from here to a corner. Um, and I also, so that's the pi over 3 angle, and the pi over 6 angle is from the center uh, to the center of an edge. So you see here the minima is very, very, very deep, around a negative 140 Kelvin. And if we zoom in on the minima, what this shows is the difference between the two calculations. So red is calculation one, an isolated nanopore, and green is this potential right here, accounting for this um, correction term. And you see the difference is pretty small. It's around one, one and a half Kelvin. Um, but the difference is present, and so it's necessary uh, to account for it. Here is a sa the same plot, but for the distance from the center to the center of an edge. And you'll notice that this potential minima is much, much shallower. Um, although the difference in the two minima is the same. And this is going to have consequences uh, that I will discuss later on. 
So here, now I'm going to start talking about my simulation results. I basically took this model for the confinement potential, plugged it into that microscopic Hamiltonian we talked about earlier, and then ran some simulations on compute clusters and collected a lot of data. So what we're looking at here is the number density of particles as a function of the chemical potential. The chemical potential serves as an analog for pressure. Um, basically, you have this pore in um, a bath of particles, and uh, the chemical potential is just the chemical potential of this external bath. And as it's increased, it forces particles into the pore. And what you observe is um, distinct layering behavior of the helium. So the density stays constant through some range of chemical potential. And then you see these sharp jumps. And that corresponds to the absorption of um, addition, an additional layer. Here I've plotted uh, two temperatures, and you see the absorption behavior is very similar for both temperatures. And this corresponds well with experimental results um, published by Junko Taniguchi. Um, what you're seeing here is um, the coverage. This is, again, essentially the analog of pressure, or you know, how many particles you're forcing into this pore. And on the y-axis is the compressibility. And these dips you see in the compressibility correspond to the absorption of a new layer of helium. You s here you see three distinct layers, which is, that, which is exactly what we saw in the previous plot. So this leads to questions about how exactly helium is arranged inside these pores. What does it look like? And I've put together a video here. Um, this is for one Kelvin. And so if you look at the top, you see chemical potential is increasing. And helium starts by absorbing in the corners, then the center of the wall, and then starts filling the center. So this is essentially first, it first absorbs in the corners because the potential minima is so much deeper there. And then it what's the midpoint of the walls um, to take advantage of the attraction from the silicate and then starts to occupy the center. And you'll see for T equals 1 Kelvin there's very similar behavior. Again, absorbing the corners first and the center of the walls and then filling the center of the core. And you'll notice that at very high chemical potentials it's about right here you start to observe this film-like behavior of the helium. And that can be understood um, by looking at the energy in the particles. So here's the total energy. Um, you see it's, it's negative, it's in a safely low energy regime, but if you look at the kinetic energy at high chemical potentials, you see this drastic increase in the value of the kinetic energy. And this causes um, what were formerly isolated 1D chains to start to exchange particles, explaining the somewhat film-like behavior we observed in the previous slide. So now I want to talk a little bit about the superfluid fraction. So at t equals 2 Kelvin, um, the superfluid fraction is pretty much identically zero for all chemical potentials. Um, this spike here is still very small, only at 0.2. And this is to be expected. The critical temperature, the transition temperature for normal fluid helium fluid to superfluid helium is around 2.17 degrees Kelvin. And it's well known that spatial confinement actually drives this transition temperature down. So we expect the superfluid fraction to be highly suppressed at 2 Kelvin. However, as we go down in temperature, you see these distinct spikes that occur at very specific chemical potentials. And um, you're probably wondering, you know, what's special about these chemical potentials? Why are these spikes located here? And that can be understood as a correlation with layering processes. If you look at these spikes, they occur immediately after a new layer has been absorbed. And this can be understood as um, an energy phenomenon. So you have this external chemical potential, and as you increase this external chemical potential, it becomes energetically favorable to accept helium atoms into the pore. And when this happens, the helium briefly goes superfluid, emits these particles, and then um, arranges into the lowest possible um, energy arrangement, and um, becomes, again, a quasi-solid, where the superfluid fraction is um, zero. So, what conclusions can we draw um, from all this data? First, within the correct range of chemical potential, helium absorbs as spatially separated 1D chains. Additionally, the energy of the system, of the system as a whole is safely within the low energy regime. And finally, a finite superfluid super fraction exists and is correlated with layering processes. So all of this tells us that um, superfluid helium absorbed into mesophore silicates is a possible candidate for the experimental realization of, of, a, of a Leninger liquid because of these three properties. So it's possible to um, measure the Leninger parameters from uh, the results of Pathenergo Monte Carlo simulations and then compare these predictions with the theory and see if they agree. 
So, in terms of future work, I'd like to collect more data for a range of four radii. The data I showed you in this presentation was only for um, a side length T of nine angstroms. I'd like to collect data for more pore sizes and examine how the size of the pore affects the absorption behavior of helium. I'd additionally like to construct some detailed estimators that I can add to the code that allow individual chains within the pore to be studied. All the data I presented is for the system as a whole, but I'd like to be able to zoom in on these specific chains and, and ask, like, what is their energy and um, superfluid fraction specifically. I'd also like to do some finite size scaling for the pore length. Again, all the data I presented is for a fixed pore length, but because correlation functions in the 1D regime uh, decay algebraically with distance, if your pore length is shorter than this decay length, then you don't accurately sample the decay of the correlation function. And so I'd like to do some finite size scaling and see how behavior scales with pore length. And finally, once I've collected some more detailed uh, data, I'd like to use the results to test the predictions of Leninger liquid theory and see if the simulations and the theory agree. So thank you all for listening to my presentation. If you have any questions, I'd be glad to answer them. You said you, in the end, you'd like to continue this research. Mm -hmm. When do you intend to do that? Um, this summer, hopefully. This summer. So you'll be around in the summer, uh, I won't be in Burlington, but Adrian and I have been continuing to get email and possibly Skype. And, uh, yeah, keep it going. Yeah? yeah so your long last plot, can you do that? So the blue is your error bar assignments. Mm -hmm. So for the rest of your points in error bars, Small. Yeah, yeah, so you can't really see them in this plot. They're actually smaller than the symbol size. The reason these ones are so large is because at low chemical potentials, the superfluid fr fraction is fluctuating between zero and this finite value. And um, because of this fluctuation, when you do um, some statistical analysis to calculate your error bars, they end up being very large. So you'd look at these and say, you can't really say the superfluid fraction is finite. It could be zero. But it is fluctuating between these two finite values, and the error bars are a bit misleading because of the way um, they're calculated. So you had number density plots for two different temperatures, t equals one, t equals two, um, mm -hmm. which is great. And then you showed us how at t equals two, the superfluid fraction is almost completely suppressed. Mm -hmm. How are you getting near equivalent number densities when your superfluid fraction is so, so much lower at t equals 2 as opposed to t equals 1. I, I honestly don't understand what's happening there. Yeah, that's a good question. I think it has to do, um, I think it's a measure of the compressibility. So there can be, it's, it's about the, I think it's about the interactions between particles. So at 2 Kelvin, I'd say the interactions, I guess, are stronger. I mean, I can't, I guess I, I don't exactly know the answer to your question. I'd have to look into it a little more. But, um, the, yeah, that's, that's a good question. I have to think about that a little more. We can talk about it after if you'd like. Sure. Let me, let me throw a different one out there for you. Mm -hmm. You said at the very beginning um, that the 1D interactions in the pores, I think your words were, uh, fermions look like bosons. Mm -hmm. So, what would happen if you did this with helium-3? Would you expect the same thing? So helium-3 poses a problem for path integral simulations because of the side change in the wave function. Although, um, theoretically speaking, in 1D they start to look similar. In the mechanics of the simulation, you get these um, very rapid side changes in the wave function, and it makes it very, very difficult to simulate them numerically and calculate averages. So it'd be difficult for my approach for studying these systems but I imagine it could be done for helium-3 as well because helium-3 is known to create Cooper pairs that behave as a boson and go superfluid, but I guess it would be difficult for, path, for this sort of path in our Monte Carlo code. I know there's um, diagrammatic Monte Carlo code that uses that actually samples Feynman diagrams instead of, sample, instead of sampling the um, particle configurations, and I think that approach to Monte Carlo gets around the sign problem that um, conventional Monte Carlo experiences. So you know I think it would be possible. The spacing in a Cooper pair for helium-3 is? That I don't know. <laughs> Might interact with your pore size. Gotcha. Good to know. Good to know. Any more questions? All right. Well, 
Again, thank you guys for listening. Thanks for being here.